Welcome to the YouTube channel of Kimpton Park Baptist de Kerk. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 to the end. Hebrews 12, verse 25 to 29. And the theme for the message is the final warning. And I'll explain that in a moment. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we worship and praise you, the living God, the eternal God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the eternal and risen Christ. We praise you, Father of heaven and earth, and pray that you would now open our hearts as you alone possess the key to the human heart, as you alone can remove a heart of stone and give a heart of flesh as you alone can transform and change people from dead sinners to living creatures in Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, by the power of the Eternal Spirit. Amen. So uh, the, that theme, the final warning, it comes from the book of Hebrews really because in Hebrews there are five warning passages. These five texts that give very strong warnings in chapter 2, chapter 3 and 4, chapter 5 and 6, chapter 10 and chapter 12. And so we are this morning going to look at, at, at least we're going to finish the final warning because it's already started and we did look at part of it, but now the end of that final warning, warning number 5. And perhaps it's also a final warning, warning in this sense that there would not be another chance for these Hebrew Christians, or at least uh, professing Christians, for these Hebrews to repent of their sin if they ignored this warning and turned their backs on Jesus and just kept on walking away from Him. And it can happen to us also. It happens when you, when you hear the word regularly, and you realize this word is true, but then you turn your back on it all and you choose to go your own way. Just like Proverbs 29 says, uh, he who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. <clears throat> A Welsh preacher called Stuart Elliot says, Those who persist in walking the road that they have chosen one day cross the invisible line. They cross the thin boundary between God's patience and his wrath. At last he says, enough is enough, and he gives them up. There is no special road which leads to hell. You just have to stay on your present road long enough. It's like that uh, pamphlet or tract that I heard of. Someone told me about this, or it was in some sermon I heard this. The guy said, uh, the tract, as someone gives the pamphlet to you, if you read on the front it says, what to do to go to hell. And when you open the pamphlet... There's nothing inside. It's empty. So that's exactly what you need to do to go to hell. Just stay on the road you are. And you'll go to hell. So let no one ignore this morning's warning. This final warning. Let's read Hebrews 12.25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So in this final warning, I'm going to give three commands from the passage. The first is, take the word of God seriously, and that is in verse 25. I remember when I was in primary school, I must have been about... Um, wow, was I 10 years old already? I don't think I was 10 at that time, perhaps younger. But I remember in the, in the newspaper in Johannesburg, I grew up in the, north, the northern province in Limpopo, 
in a town called Lutrichard. And um, I remember visiting my grandparents in Joburg, and it was in the, the big newspaper. Uh, what was it, the Citizens or Citizen or something of the sort? I can't even remember the paper. But a boy in my school, he was older than I was, him and his friend went hunting on the farm or just shooting with his father's gun, and he, he played with a gun as if it were a toy, and he shot his friend with a shotgun. Now, very happily and gladly, and uh, he didn't kill his friend, but that just illustrates to me how some people fall under the wrath of God because they play with the Word. They don't take the word of God seriously, like that boy didn't take a real weapon seriously. Almost like in the book of Kings when these young boys, uh, they mocked the word of God. They mocked God's prophet Elisha, who, who was supposed to bring the word. They didn't want the word. And he cursed them in the name of the Lord and two she-bears came out of the woods and killed 42 of them. Because they played with the word. So let us rather listen to the word of God. Listen to the word that God speaks to us through his son. Just like Israel had to listen when God spoke the word from Sinai in verse 19. The words that they had to listen to. And now in our verse 25, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking. They didn't. They didn't escape it when they refused God when he warned on earth, it says. So God speaks to us. Even this morning, he speaks through his Son, who is the Word, the living Word. Like in Hebrews 1 verse 1, in these last days, God has spoken to us through his Son. And then listen to the words that are spoken to God speaking, to Christ speaking, when his blood calls out from the earth, from the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Verse 24 speaks of the blood of Jesus that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And just like Israel, Israel should not have refused. They shouldn't have refused God when he spoke on earth on Mount Sinai, verse 25. And in the same way, we should not refuse when God speaks. We should not be like those people in Luke 14. They refused when, when the messengers came and said, the king's inviting you to his son's wedding. But they refused. Don't refuse God when he speaks. So how should you take God's word seriously? Well, read the Bible. Read the Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand. And so that you can believe what is written and that you can obey what is written. And then also, don't, don't stay away from the preaching of God's word for no reason. If you, if you stay away for no reason when God's word is preached here and you're part of this congregation, well, it shows it's not very important to you. The preaching's not important. The word of God's not important. You don't value it enough. Even though you can tell people, I really value the word. Well, the fact that you stay away for no reason shows that you don't value the word and you don't regard it as important. And then also, as long as God's word is proclaimed accurately, biblical preaching, then you shouldn't mind who preaches. If it's a true servant of God, and the word of God is preached accurately, but you sit at home because it's not your favorite pastor in the pulpit, your favorite preacher in the pulpit, well, that shows you are more interested in the pastor than in the word of God. And then you're not taking God's word seriously. And then also, if you eagerly listen to the preaching, you love good preaching, but you don't obey it. Well, if you, if you just like listening to good preaching, but you're not obedient, it shows you love theological ideas more than you love Jesus. So that is why I say, take God's word seriously. When the Israelites disobeyed, when they refused God, verse 25, when he warned from earth, when he warned from Mount Sinai, that was no game. Uh, God was serious about that and God punished them. And do you think you will escape God's judgment if you refuse God's word? If you refuse him who is speaking, when he speaks from heaven, when he appeared from heaven, he came down from heaven and he spoke to us. 
How will you escape God's judgment? We saw that in chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. If they neglected the law and they turned away from that and they didn't escape, how will we escape if we neglect the gospel, if we refuse the gospel? You, you, just, you just need to look at the cross of Jesus Christ to see how God feels about sin. And do you think you will escape? You will escape if you take the gospel lightly and you just continue in the way of sin. It is no small matter if you reject Jesus Christ and the cross of Jesus for sinners. It's no small matter if you decide I will reject Christ and his cross and continue and find my own way of salvation, even though your way of salvation may include good things like baptism or quiet time or evangelism or gathering with believers. As much as God hates immorality, shameful immorality, so much He hates self-righteousness. He hates it when people are self-righteous. And He hates it because by self-righteousness, people in effect are saying, the cross of Jesus is not special. The cross of Jesus is not sufficient to save me. My righteousness is as good as His. God is not that holy. God doesn't hate sin that much. As long as I try my best and do more good than bad, then He will forgive me. I'd say, I'd venture to say it's, it's better for you to try and steal a lion cub from its mother than to tell the father that his son's death is not sufficient and you have got some better way to be saved. Number two, second command. Make sure that you are part of the church or see to it that you are part of the church. That's verse 26 to 28a. So, the people in Great Britain during the Second World War, when the Nazis bombed London, uh, when they hid in their underground shelters, they were safe. And in the same way, you and I, we need to, we need to find shelter, we need to hide in the temple, the new temple of Jesus Christ, Jesus and His church, if you want to escape God's judgment, if you want to escape the shaking, as it's called in these verses, when God shakes the earth, heaven and earth. Because Jesus is the new temple. He said so, destroy this temple in three days, I'll build it up. And he was speaking about his body. And he calls, in Revelation 21, 22, he is called the temple. There's no temple in heaven because God himself is the temple and the lamb. Christ, his son. Uh, and then the church is called the temple. That's obvious because God, Christ is the head with the body. So, or he's the foundation and we're the living stones. So we are the new temple, 1 Corinthians 3.16 and Ephesians 2, verse 19 to 22. And also in, in 1 Peter, he says the same. He says, we are living stones. 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and verse 6 speaks of Christ as the cornerstone. He's the foundation stone. So that's how I understand verse 26 to 28a. It says, at that time... His voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that, are, that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Now, what the author does here is quoting from the book of Haggai, chapter 2, verse 6. And most, most commentators, they'd say that Haggai is referring to the second coming, but I'm not so sure that that is the only thing that he has in mind. In the context, if you read that section of Haggai, then you see that the, the Israelites who had returned from captivity from Babylon, when they came back, they started rebuilding the temple. Uh, when Haggai prophesied, because they'd left it for a time, they'd started rebuilding the city, but not the temple. And now they started rebuilding the temple. But as they were building, they really became discouraged because their temple is not as fancy and not as glorious and not as beautiful as Solomon's temple, the temple that had been before the Babylonians destroyed it. And so they're really discouraged, and Haggai encourages them. And he says, keep on, don't give up, keep on. The Spirit of the Lord is with you. He will help you in this. And one day... 
God is going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and all the nations will come and they'll bring their treasures into this new temple and the new temple, this glory will be, its glory will be greater than any temple that has been in the past. And then Haggai even says it's going to happen in a very short time. In Haggai 2 verse 6. And the, the writer to the Hebrews in verse 26, he says, but now he has promised, and then he quotes Haggai, so he's saying, this is happening in my time, in my day. Now, this is happening now, that God is building the new temple. And that he's going to shake, as he shaked the earth when he gave the law at Mount Sinai. Uh, we saw that last week, verse 18 and 19. So now, verse 26, he's going to shake heaven and earth. And that is what Haggai prophesied. And that, I believe, happened when God destroyed the stone temple the Jerusalem temple in AD 70, when God sent the Romans to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. So, so there was a shaking when God inaugurated the Old Covenant, when He gave the Old Covenant. But there was also a shaking when He brought the Old Covenant to its final end with the destruction of the temple and uh, animal sacrifices and the Old Testament priesthood. And when the New Testament temple, the church, um, even more and more as it... As it uh, it had already spread, but now even more, it spreads across the earth. Now someone will say, yes, but heaven and earth wasn't shaken when God destroyed the Jerusalem temple in AD 70. But what the Bible authors do is they use cosmic terms, symbolic terms, to describe God's judgment in this sense. Peter believed that it had happened in his day. Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verse 16, and then he goes on to quote a prophecy of Joel in the Old Testament. But Peter says, what you are seeing happening now is this. And then he quotes Joel. This is what's happening. And then Joel uses those cosmic terms in, in Acts 2 verse 20 as Peter quotes it. Of um, sun being darkened and the moon turning, becoming like blood. And there are wonders in heaven above and the earth below and so on. And even Jesus, Jesus described the destruction of the temple using similar terms. In Luke 21, verse 6 and 7, he says, this temple is going to be destroyed. You won't see one stone upon another. And then they asked the disciples, when will these things be? What is the sign that these things are going to take place? Meaning the destruction of the temple. And then Jesus describes it in cosmic terms. Again, the sun being darkened, moon turning to blood, shaking and all of that. Uh, the powers of the heavens are shaken and that's Luke 21, 25, and 26. And most people say that's referring to the second coming. But Jesus himself says just a few verses on in uh, Luke 21, verse 32. Luke says that all these things will take place while this generation is still alive. So Jesus obviously is speaking about the destruction of the Jerusalem temple as the question was asked to him. And he shakes it in such a way, when, when he shakes it, then he removes this temple that is made with hands. Um, verse 27. The removal of things that are shaken, that is things that have been made. Like the temple was made with human hands. And he shakes it. He destroys it. It's no more. And then the New Testament temple or the church cannot be shaken. So when the Old Testament temple was shaken, was destroyed... Uh, the stone temple, the Jerusalem temple in AD 70, the church wasn't destroyed, verse 27, the end, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. The New Testament temple, as Jesus said, it will never end. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And it won't be shaken at the second coming either. The church will stand. Are you part of this church? I'm not talking about this congregation. Yes, perhaps this congregation, but I'm talking about are you part of the church of Jesus Christ on earth? Are you part of the new temple? And if not, again, like last week, I want, you, I want to encourage you to become part. Become part. Repent and believe the gospel. Accept Christ as your Savior. Be born of God. Come to Christ, believe in Christ, and believe He will keep His promise that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then you profess that and confess that through baptism. And then you become part of the church. You become part of this church 
or another biblical church, the church that loves Jesus Christ, become part of the ch a church that preaches the Bible, that obeys the Bible, um, and that proclaims the Bible and preaches the gospel to the lost and worships God in spirit and in truth. Now, someone might criticize me and say, well, God saves through Jesus. He doesn't save through the church. I know. I know that. But you must remember that Jesus is the head of the church. So to be a lone ranger Christian, where you just serve God on your own, you're not part of the body of Christ that is unbiblical. And it grieves Jesus. It grieves Him who lay down His life for the church. God purchased the church through His own blood. Acts 20 verse 28. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Ephesians 5.25 Now perhaps you, you think that I sound like a Roman Catholic or I sound like some cult who says that salvation lies in the church. That's not what I'm saying. Salvation is in Christ alone. But how does Christ save us? He uses the church. He uses people who share the good news, whether they are pastors or missionaries or evangelists or Bible transla translators or, or just lay Lay members. He uses the church. And it's these people who come and they bear the, the truth of God, the truth of Jesus, the truth of the gospel. They bear like a torch. And they bring it to others who are in darkness so that they can believe and be saved. The church God has called into this world to be a, the ground and pillar of the truth or the foundation of, and pillar of the truth. To take the gospel to all nations. And that is how he then makes us part of his kingdom. Through the church. The church. Verse 28a. Therefore let's be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Matthew 16 verse 18 and 19. Jesus makes a very clear draws a very clear line or parallel between the church and the kingdom. Matthew 16, verse 18 and 19. We, know, we heard verse 18 just now. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, or Hades. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So the keys of the kingdom means you preach the gospel as the church. And then people enter the kingdom by repentance and faith. And if you're not part of the church, when Jesus Christ returns, well, and you're not part of this kingdom, I'm not talking about filling out some form. I'm talking about being part spiritually. If you're not part of this, He will shake you. He will shake you. He will shake you with this present universe, as Second Peter tells us. Or Hebrews 1, 11 and 12. This, this world is passing away. It will be shaken. So it's only those who are part of the church and of the kingdom that will remain. And, and I don't mean that you inherit the kingdom just because your name is on some list somewhere or you on some membership role somewhere at some church. I'm talking here about that God gives us the kingdom if you are part of His church spiritually. Spiritually, if you are born again. If you are one with Christ and His body, the church, I give you a kingdom. I assign to you a kingdom. And here we see in verse 28 also, the kingdom is given to us. So let us be thankful, it says, for receiving this kingdom. And we have a, a foretaste of this kingdom, just a very little foretaste of this kingdom in the church. So show to the Lord that you are really thankful and grateful for receiving a kingdom. Show him you are grateful by becoming part of the church. Or if you are really part of the church, show your thankfulness, your gratefulness by being here regularly. Where believers gather to worship the Lord. Or if you are here regularly, become more involved and encourage others to do the same. If Jesus gave his life for the church, then I'm sure you and I can give our time for the church and for Christ our head, the Lord of the church. Number three. Offer acceptable worship. That's the third command. Offer acceptable worship. Verse 28b and 29. I heard this in a sermon by a pastor in Joburg 
And he is told of how he went to preach at a visiting church. And the music group, when they are done playing, they went to sit right at the back of the church, sitting on their necks. <laughs> you know, when young people slouch and literally lie on their necks in the pew. And uh, this is what these young people did, ready to sleep while, when the pastor is going to preach. And he woke them up. He said, hey, you young people at the back, wake up. That wasn't the only part of worship, the singing. Preaching is also worship. Sit up straight. And you see, a Christian's whole life is worship. Romans 12, verse 1, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Our whole life is worship, but when I speak of worship this morning, I'm referring to corporate worship, when the believers gather to worship God. So worship then is not just singing. Worship is partaking at the, in, at the Lord's table, uh, taking part in the Lord's table and the prayers and the scripture readings and uh, when we serve one another and when the word of God is proclaimed, when it's preached and the offerings giving to the Lord's work and testimonies and fellowship and so on. So just like the priests in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice animals, so in the New Testament, we bring all of these things I just mentioned, preaching and singing and prayers and scripture readings and so on, we bring that as spiritual gifts, as spiritual sacrifices, like we read in chapter 13, verse 15 and 16, our, our praises and our uh, sharing and Romans fifteen sixteen when we bring people to Jesus, new believers, and Philippians four eighteen when we give to missions, and uh, Revelation five and, and Revelation eight when we pray, those are all sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices, and not animal sacrifices, but spiritual sacrifices. One Peter two verse five, and so we offer it to the Father through Jesus the Mediator by the power of the Holy Spirit who works all of this in us. He works these things in us. Verse 24 speaks of Jesus the mediator. Verse 28b, let us offer acceptable worship. So that's what we offer to God. And Ephesians 2.18, through him we both have access, that is Jew and Gentile, we both have access through him, that is Jesus, by one spirit to the Father. And that is in the, the first place, in the very first place, that is what we need. If your and my worship is going to be acceptable to God, it must be to the triune God. We must worship the triune God. You cannot, you cannot cut out or remove one of the persons of the Trinity and say, I don't worship the Spirit, or I don't worship the Son, or not the Father. Then God will not be pleased with your and my worship. It must be pleasing worship. Or if you don't come by faith in Jesus, if you don't believe in Jesus, well... Your worship is not acceptable. He who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. But without faith it is impossible to please God. So God is not interested in your worship if you are not a Christian, if you are not a believer. Or if you do like these Hebrews who were tempted to do, to return to the Old Testament rituals, and you focus on your rituals instead of on Jesus, then your worship is unacceptable. Like, for instance, the Hebrew Roots Movement where they want to return to all the Old Testament rituals, it is unacceptable to God. He has given us more light. He has given us the new covenant in His Son, Jesus Christ. And then also our worship is unacceptable if you worship God and, and you've got all these uh, emotions and it's sincere and you are really sincere in your worship, but your worship is not according to God's Word. And what happens with people like that is they worship what they're chasing is the nice feeling. They want the feeling instead of worshipping to glorify God. And they're so arrogant that they think they can worship God in a way that pleases them, in a way that's nice to them. I really enjoy this worship. Instead of worshipping God as He says, as He tells us He wants to be worshipped, as He tells us in the Bible. And, and in the end, your worship ends up being like the worship of Nadab and Abihu. You waltz into the tabernacle. You waltz into God's presence and you think you can do it your way and God kills you. You like Uzzah. You think I can worship the God uh, the way I, it pleases me. I'm all happy and we're dancing and we're singing and we're worshipping and we got the ark carried on an ox cart where God plainly and clearly told the Israelites in the book of Numbers, you do not transport the ark on a cart. It's to be transported on foot. And they thought they're grand and they're great. And as Azza tried to prevent the ark from falling, when the oxen stumbled, God killed him. 
So it's sincere worship, but it's not according to God's word. It's unacceptable. And verse 29 tells us, or 28b, we must offer acceptable worship. And then our worship is also unacceptable if we worship God according to the Bible, but our hearts are not in it. So in other words, we're going through the motions of worship, but your thoughts are somewhere else. You worship because you must and not because you want to. There's no emotion of love and gratefulness and reverence and awe and fear. So if we want to worship God aright, if we want to do it as God, as it pleases God, acceptable worship, then we need a great view of God. A great view of God. A great vision of a great God. And a small view of ourselves. And if we have that kind of view, well then our singing and our praying and our preaching won't be about me, myself and I. But it will truly come with fear and with awe, with reverence to this God whom we worship. Verse 28 at the end. Acceptable worship with reverence and awe. As the Israelites at Mount Sinai, or Moses at least, with fear and trembling. Serve the Lord with gladness, rejoice with trembling. Serve the Lord with fear. So that is, if we worship in that way, that is then the Holy Spirit coming and He moves our hearts through the Word. And our hearts are not moved because of colored lights and smoke and Music so loud that your ears want to split and repetitive music and it's just repetitive, 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 repetitive. Um, and everyone around you is emotional and that moves you. No, no. It's the Spirit who moves your heart through the truth of the Word. And yet, I do want to say, there is nothing wrong with people, as we sing, they put up a hand in the air and they are overjoyed or they are saddened because of their own sin or while I preach someone says aloud, Amen. There's nothing wrong with that. People have different personalities and different temperaments. We, we differ. Um, so let's not try and force people. You have to do it the way I do. Like we had in this church. Before I got here, apparently, I've been here 16 years now, but before I got here, there was a, a church meeting where people said, right, we're going to vote on this. Should we stick up our hands in the air when we sing, or shouldn't we? And that's just nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Any worship that agrees and is in line with the Word of God, and it's orderly worship, and it comes from the heart, and it's by faith in Christ, and it's in the fear of God... That is acceptable to God, whether you put up your hand or you don't, whether you say Amen aloud when you agree with something in the sermon, or if you, if you don't. But if you don't worship God, and you don't fear Him in that way, and you don't reverence God, well then you should remember verse 29, our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. He can cast you in hell, in, into hell in an instance. He's the consuming fire of Mount Sinai. He's the consuming fire of Isaiah 33 verse 14. He's the consuming fire of Christ who will return at the second coming in flaming fire. So we should worship God only as He tells us. Because He is the one who created you. He is the one who has saved you. He is the one who deserves your loyalty. And you will never be happy. And you will never find fulfillment until you worship God in a way that is acceptable to Him. He has made you. And He has made you to worship and praise Him. Like one man in our church, Niels. He's got a website called Born to Praise. It's all kinds of music that he writes. But that's right. That's why he was born. He was born, he was created to praise God. And if you don't worship and praise God, well then you're like a fish out, out, outside of the water. Or you're like a, a bird and your wings have been clipped and you sit in a cage. 
Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help our church, this congregation also, to worship you in an acceptable way, to honor and glorify you, to do as pleases as it would please you, Father. Please guide us and teach us how to live the Christian life for the glory of your name. Amen.